Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Actor's Voice, Conversations on Acting and Singing with John and Russ. Today we have with us Chadley Ballantyne uh, here from Stetson University. Chadley's a bass baritone who's sung leading roles in productions of Ronaldo, Madame Butterfly, Falstaff, Don Giovanni, Cozy, Le Nozze di Figaro, Elijah the Pirates, a whole host of things here. Sweeney Todd, which I would love to have seen. Uh, <laughs> he's performed with Opera Fort Collins, Fresco Opera Theater, Shout out to Melanie Kane, who we spoke to earlier this week. Uh, Union Avenue Opera, Light Opera Works, Opera for the Young, Utah Festival Opera, uh, Opera Orlando, uh, and again, a host of others. He's an assistant professor of music and voice at Stetson University. He's previously served on the faculties at the University of Northern Colorado, the Theater Conservatory of Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt University and North Park University. Uh, Dr. Ballantyne is a frequent guest speaker on the topic of applying vocal acoustic pedagogy for both classical and CCM techniques. He has presented his work for Chicago chapter of NATS at the 2017 Pan American Vocology Association Symposium in Toronto, uh, the 2017 West Central and Central Region NATS conferences, the 55th NATS National Conference in LA, uh, Las Vegas, sorry, uh, and the, the Vasta Pava 2018 Joint Conference in Seattle, amongst a host of others that he has done. He's a very, very busy man, and we are thrilled <laughs> that he is taking some time to talk to us. Chadley, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Great. Uh, our first question always is, how did you get here? What, where did you come from and, and how do you get to where you are right now? What was the path that you took? Oh, goodness. Well, um, everybody has a unique path, I suppose. Um, I actually, uh, as far as where I came from, I grew up in Southern Iowa on a farm in a little town called Lamoni, actually two miles outside of a very little town called Lamoni. And even though there were only 1900 people in the town and it was the biggest town in the county, um, we had a pretty vibrant music program. So I played uh, violin, I played in the band and my freshman year of high school, I decided I was too busy for choir and <laughs> I, had to, I had to let something go. And the new choir director and my best friend uh, teamed up to strong arm me into choir and, uh, <laughs> and I'm so glad they did. So the first year of choir, I remember we had a, like a range test where you, you stayed standing until you couldn't sing that high or that low. <laughs> and I remember not sitting down <laughs> and then bouncing around a few sections for a while. <laughs> and when I got to the end of high school, I, I, I knew I wanted to go to college. I wasn't sure for what, I was really into graphic arts I was really into history and deep down in my heart, I knew I'd always wanted to be a music professor. Um, but I didn't even consider that because I didn't think musicians came from farms in the middle of Southern Iowa. Um, <laughs> but my choir director again was like, well, what are you doing for college? I'm like, I don't know. I think I'm going to do architecture having no idea how much math that involved. Um, <laughs> and she was like, well, you should really, um, you should really consider auditioning for voice. I was like, that's a thing. And, uh, and I ended up getting, you know, some great opportunities to go to school for voice and realized that, oh, singers can come from farms in Southern Iowa. And, uh, so that's where I, I started from. And even through my undergrad, I, I always had in the back of my head, I really wanted to teach. I loved performing, I loved singing, I loved singing art song. And I was, I was really fascinated with the sounds of opera and I just loved trying to make those sounds and listening to them. But I always had in the back of my head that, gosh, I really wanna teach this someday. Um, I wanna be a part of an institution. I, I just love, I just love the vibe of a school of music. And, uh, and so I went to grad school and just kind of kept going after it, but I didn't actually teach anybody until pretty late in grad school. Cause I was like, I don't, I don't know how this works yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, um, my wife, Laura, who I met in choir, in the first year of college, she and I were in grad school together and uh, she was teaching and running a music program outside of the school of music. I was like, well, you guys, you just got to start teaching. You just got to get your feet wet. So she gave me a couple students and I'm, 
I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of shy and awkward. And I went into that first lesson not knowing what to expect. And my brain just switched into this other mode. And I was <laughs> suddenly just teaching someone, this young person, how to sing and just having a blast, even though I wasn't sure I knew what, how anything worked yet. Um, but yeah, from there, I just, I kept taking every opportunity I had to teach. And um, when we left grad school and we moved to Chicago, I just, it was right in the middle of the recession. So the job I had lined up closed down the day we got there. Mm. Um, and I just took every opportunity I could find. So at first I was driving like 110 miles a day to teach like 10 students. And by the second year I was, I was, I was teaching like 20 to 30 students. And by the fourth, the third year, it was like 40 students. And by like year four or five, I was up to 70 students and just, just like every opportunity I could, whatever style it was, age group, skill level, just learned so much about, you know, how to lead people through a lesson, how to troubleshoot just about any style or problem that came up. And, and then started like from there, like zeroing in on university appointments as an adjunct instructor first and in, in a classical program in a, in a music and worship program and a theater program. And yeah, uh, it really kind of started concentrating in on the city and a few university programs. I had the opportunity to teach for a year at the University of Northern Colorado. And then it came down to, uh, and I'm making a choice after that. And, and then at Stetson, this will be my third year. Um, and it's, it's pretty, it's been quite a journey. I, at the time when I was teaching 70 lessons a week, I was like, I can't sustain this for the rest of my life, but I am so thankful for this opportunity to just really hone my craft. And that, that, that was, that's how I got here basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think Russ and I can can commiserate uh, for my my time in the in Minneapolis. I was also doing 60, 70 hours a week of lessons, and you know when you're doing it, you're going back to back to back and going, please make it stop. But you, you <laughs> learn so much, and because there's so much repetition, you know you, you you have opportunity to see what works and what doesn't, and in real times, you see the development so quickly when you're teaching that much. Well, and I think it's really telling because, you know, you, when you start off as a voice teacher, it's not like, you know, a music ed degree where there is the licensure and the pedagogy and, and, you know, you study pedagogy, but um, you do it as a, through the lens of a singer. And uh, the first time you get into a studio and you're like, whoa, I'm the teacher. What do I do with that? Right? Uh, and then, um, you know, you're building this studio, but it's, it, it almost feels like trial and error and you're worried about it. And then suddenly you realize that like, I'm, I'm building a repertoire. I'm building a, uh, I'm building a, a methodology for how I teach these students. And, and, and uh, it, it comes with time, but it's, uh, it's daunting at first, right? It's wild. Yeah. <laughs> I found, especially as I started teaching all those back to backs, um, is that instead of like warming the student up and then figuring out what the issue was or how to make it better, I just, I developed this mindset of like, I had like two or three modules each week. I would teach them to everybody. You walk in the door, we're learning a skill or we're learning a new exercise. Mm -hmm. If there's something else that needs to be addressed that we have to address that day, fine. Or if there's a performance coming up and we need to really spot check something, fine. But in general, it would be, I would take these two or three modules and then over the course of the week, teach that lesson 70 times. <laughs> and by the end of it, and to like middle schoolers, high schoolers, college singers, young professionals, vocational singers. And by the end of it, I had a pretty good idea uh, of its success rates or how to translate that for different, um, for different students, um, how to, what verbiage for me to use that would, or how emotionally to present it or which words to avoid, like which verbs would, um, convey the wrong result. Um, and what I was really cool about that is 
I did that for my own sanity because it kept me very focused and it made it easy for me to just go through all those lessons. Um, but what I started noticing too was that made the lesson space much safer for my students because they walked in the door not feeling like they're about to be judged they were walking in the door and be like, ooh, what cool new thing are we learning today? <laughs> what weird sound are we making today? <laughs> um, <laughs> it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Uh, I'm still cool and there's not gonna be any judgment on the other side of that door. Just, we're gonna learn a new skill and play around with it. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, and, it's, and it's, it does flip the model on its head from like, oh, I practiced all week, what's he gonna pick on next, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I love it. Um, I'd love to, to delve into your time in Chicago a little bit um, on the, the performance side. Mm. I, I know you've got a, a diverse palette of things that you have done <laughs> on the stage. So what, what, what did you find useful as you were kind of cutting your teeth as a performer? How did you find gigs? Uh, what what got your attention? Um, let, let's start as, as early in that process as we can. Yeah. So, gosh, it's it's really... You know, for me, it was great being in a city um, with so many different opportunities from, you know, just little gigs to, you know, some really w wonderful opportunities. Um, when I guess the number one thing for me was was networking um, as far as like my approach to making connections when I got there, I just kept telling myself work begets work. Um, there were a lot of gigs I took just to meet people. I was like, well, I'm getting a sandwich for this gig, but I think there's another cool baritone who's going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> wait, wait, you got a sandwich? <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> there was one place we got half off on our uh, entrees. <laughs> and I met a whole bunch of really cool people there to, <laughs> and, and I would go do these, like, you know, these random little gigs just to, just to meet people and, and, uh, um, um, and just see, like, you know, you never know, like, when that's gonna pay off down the road. Um, I, uh, so I did that. And then I was just auditioning any audition that came up. I would go there you start seeing all the same people at the same auditions and be like punching in punching out <laughs> <laughs> and um but you know after a little bit of time of just you know singing just random little gigs picking up some bigger gigs you just start meeting people who are like hey uh my friend's doing a show up in madison you should <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd like them. You're doing some weird theater stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think you want to run around a stage with a lot of bronzer on, don't you? I was like, of course I do. <laughs> and then um, there was Don Giovanni beer pong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yeah, and I took some fun gigs in theater and storefront theater. And that was, that had an impact on what I was doing because I started um rather than just like my experience in opera was really fun in in the staging side of it and the acting side but then doing some experimental theater work and meeting directors more from the storefront theater scene in chicago was really eye-opening as far as how to connect text and music and what acting could be um and that like comparing that with the kind of more traditional large grand uh acting in opera compared to like really up close um understated uh, you know <laughs> just kind of like allowing it to be there acting that um that was really encouraged in that scene and then also some of the just the ways of building kind of group flow um that that had a that was really reassuring for me too because I, in my work, I didn't really enjoy like the big showy acting. I I liked kind of the more like, here's me, <laughs> and uh, I've I've let that influence how I approach the acting that I teach in my studio, where it's like let's really connect speech and emotion, and then see what happens rather than adding a layer of uh, or a barrier 
between the person and the audience. Um, so yeah, I just, I did, you know, I, I did shows with really small houses. I did shows in houses. I did shows with uh, regional companies there. Um, and I think some of my most fun times uh, with that were up at Fresco Opera, where, where you and I sang together, Jonathan. Um, and uh, I did a, I did three shows with them mm. while I was in that area. My favorite, uh, well, I mean, the most favorite was Don Giovanni Beer Pong. Yeah. But, <laughs> but singing Rinaldo, uh, so yeah. singing um, uh, Argante dressed up as Darth Vader and doing lightsaber battles <laughs> in pretty Rinaldo, awesome. that, that was pretty cool. So, <laughs> yeah, some of the theater stuff that I did probably not safe for air but <laughs> <laughs> it was just really fun and doing a lot of different uh choral gigs um and i would say like you know people uh looking at like gigging at least the way it was when i came up in chicago who knows exactly what the landscape will look like after all this is done um when we can start singing live again um but i wish i had sought out more opportunities for choral training in grad school I had kind of a I didn't have a very positive experience with that in my undergrad so um, I kind of stayed away from that in grad school and I wish I hadn't because um, I really enjoyed the experiences I had as a professional singer um, but I so I kind of wish I'm looking for more I did a really cool show with Opera Orlando uh, this winter that was all as calm Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, um, tenor, baritone, bass, all ensemble singing. Um, and that just really fed my soul <laughs> to be with a group of guys like that who are all such excellent musicians and singers and to sing that kind of tight harmony uh, at like 110 decibels. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I could do that for the rest of my life. That was that was great. So I'm 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 open to do some more work like that as you know, as we kind of see how performing settles in this this uh this new environment. Post COVID landscape is gonna be fascinating. Right. <laughs> and and, partic and particularly for group singing. Uh it's just such a wild time, you know. I mean, obviously we're worried on a on a solo level about being in studio and things like that, but like any kind of gathering of course just like for for the public it's gatherings in general for us it's like oh we're gonna sing in a group that's <laughs> that's scary right now but hopefully it won't be for long right yeah. i agree <clears throat> fingers crossed wow <laughs> to to move off of the sadness of covid right uh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to linger there are, are, yeah. Not that any of us are, are dealing with all of the fallout and, and how are we going to manage our, you know, next three months. Uh, <laughs> let, let's talk about your process with a student. Uh, so you get a new student in. Um, what are the things you're looking for? What are the things you're looking at? Um, just as pedagogue with a, a blank slate in front of you, what do you do? Sure. So in some ways, it's the same for every student. Um, and then a couple factors will be different kind of depending on, you know, what how old are they what are they what is their goal or what are their goals and what style are they planning to train primarily in so at the moment uh the majority of my students are undergraduate classical singers um and uh but in my private teaching it's it really ranges all over the place um so the very first things I'm listening for is even when we're talking, I'm listening for articulation. I'm listening for uh, vocal fold function. Like I'm listening for how cleanly the phonation's happening. Are there any subharmonics in their regular speaking voice? Um, do I hear high frequency energy in their speaking voice? How present is it? and what effort level are they at? Um, do they speak with a wide range of inflection or is it mostly monotone? Um, do they have, is there any sign of lisp or uh, 
prevalent nasality? Um, do they, what aspects of a regional dialect are there that might conflict with the style they want to sing? Um, I'm also looking for just kind of their emotional well-being, like where are they coming? Like what state are they in coming to these lessons? Like, um, you know, um, how do they feel about their voice? How do they feel about the journey they've been on? You know, are they already, <laughs> are, they ar are they already bitter? <laughs> or um, is there something they're scared about um, in their vocal journey? Um, that I'm listening for a lot of that stuff even before we start vocalizing. Um, and I'm also trying to create a safe environment because it's, I mean, it's, it's easier to be on the, I think it's easier to be on the teacher side emotionally than on the student side. Um, Cause it's a little scary to walk in and, and feel like, Oh, I'm so excited to learn. I need, I, I, I'm driven to learn. I'm going to take the risk of walking through this door or clicking on this Jitsi meat link <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, like revealing my vocal faults to this person who might judge me and I hope will help me. So right off the bat, I want to create an open environment where they feel like this is about learning and this is about improving, not about being called out for your faults. Um, and then in the early vocalizing that I'm really listening again for the things I mentioned in their speech, but then in the vocalizing, when we start with just little simple patterns, I'm listening for uh, how the voice functions across register breaks and, and watching for how their breathing system seems to be working. Um, a lot of the stuff's predictable because that's like where events are gonna happen or where their voice sits because as like unique each voice is individually as an instrument, they're all relatively the same. They just kind of land on different spots on the same roadmap or the same like schematic. And just the range might fall on one end of that schematic or the other. Um, so that's, that's what I'm looking for. And then within the first 10 minutes, I wanna show them something cool. I want them to feel like, ooh, <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> or that was a weird exercise. <laughs> um, what's the next weird exercise? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so interesting because I think you said a lot of really interesting things that um, that make sense. Uh, you know, students come to us with really individual instruments, but, you know, at the same time, there are those commonalities right the technical stuff that we learn in pedagogy like where do the passages sit how is the you know what type of voice are we looking at but uh, where they are emotionally what baggage they carry uh, what um, prior experiences have they had vocally that have colored their perception of their own sound like all of that makes it unique you know a baritone isn't just a baritone a tenor isn't just a tenor <laughs> Um, it's fascinating and it's the kind of stuff that people don't think about, but, um, that influence so much what we do with these individuals. I think it's really neat to hear about how you structure that lesson. Yeah. And I think, I think mm, starting out as an independent teacher, working primarily, primarily with adolescent singers at first and, and these singers being assigned to me to start. So they didn't seek, seek me out, at least like the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and working with mostly adolescent sopranos, um, just really creating like that safe environment from the moment you walk in the door, you know, this is a safe room. There are real boundaries here that are safe and we're gonna work on singing and I'm gonna have fun learning a new idea and I'm going to learn something new about my new voice and to get that buy-in, both that, that letting down the guard a little bit, be like, okay, no lions and tigers in this room. <laughs> and, and that buy-in right off the bat of like, oh yeah, that, that, 
that felt cool. Or, huh, that wasn't what I was expecting, but I want to learn a little bit more. So getting that buy-in within the first 20 minutes, um, <laughs> I've, I kind of took it for granted because that's just how you had to do it. Because if you didn't do it that way, you wouldn't get students back. <clears throat> but then now as I'm, you know, um, meeting with my college students and high school students that might be thinking about college, um, and then working with professionals who have maybe had like a rough experience at some point, um, and are really kind of coming back to lessons because they have to, because I feel like it's, it, they, it's do or die at that point. You know, I see that skill of being like, come on in, <laughs> don't worry in 10 minutes, you're going to be feeling a little bit better. <laughs> that, that really does have a big impact on, on, on the, the work that I'm doing. So I'm very thankful for that <laughs> baptism by fire that I had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, not everybody does that. Not everybody has that mentality of, I'm, I'm going to give you something right off the bat that's going to be a hook. Um, they, they, they think for whatever reason, I need to do the long game or I've got to address so many different issues. And, but, but being able to get to that one thing that'll, that'll spark a fire, that'll really catch a student is so important because so much of what we do is about motivation. And if you don't have that, you, you're sunk. You're done. <laughs> yep. And what's great is, you know, <clears throat> the the instrument you can't really take. You can't really isolate one part of it. That it it's always working together. There are a couple ways. Like if you shut off the voice, <laughs> you can work like a couple things, but that's not really the same. Um, you can work on breathing in isolation, but but really you can't really do any of the of the instrument just completely isolated for the from the rest or separated so the my go to exercises for those first lessons are are ones that will just improve function they're novel they're kind of silly and they have like a 90% <laughs> rough math but i used to keep track of this stuff not writing it down but just in my head but like a 90 to 95% success rate yeah. And and a really low probability that they've done the exercise before. And so that even if it's not, I'm going to address, even if it's not, I'm addressing every single fault that I hear. Um, I'm going to make your voice feel better. And this is going to be an exercise that you'll use in your daily practice. That's that's awesome. Can, can I put you on the spot? Sure. Can, can we see uh, <laughs> one, one or two of these miracle <laughs> exercises that you start off <laughs> <laughs> they are kind of really yeah, miracle, but they're, they're strange. You may have seen some of these before, um, but the one is one of my go-tos in a first lesson um, is Buzzy Card. So <laughs> I learned this from Marianne Hart uh, at Indiana University. Uh, she was a master teacher in the Nats intern program when I was there in 2015. And you hold up a Buzzy Card. <laughs> and um, you, you can use like a magazine insert or an index card and you just hold it in front of your face. You don't put it to your lips, but right in front and you make a tiny little stream of air and sound through your mouth. Ooh, that's kind of similar to the Stemple vocal function exercises. Mm -hmm. And you bring the card into that stream and it vibrates. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> it feels really good. Uh, the first time I learned this, uh, Marianne was like, Chad, check this out. Does this work for guys? <laughs> 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 and, and I, I took a next card. I was like, mm, we're like, Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> Middle C's never felt like that for me before. <laughs> I, I'm going to go check this out. I will report back. So, um, it's, you know, it's a semi occluded exercise that is similar to a finger kazoo mm -hmm. where you just hold your finger to your lip, mm -hmm. but it's really great at getting good adduction while unpressing the voice and encouraging flow phonation and really encouraging just a, a more balanced instrument. And, it, and the card in particular is good for working out, um, laryngeal registration events in a way that covers them up, whereas straw phonation like really brings them out mm -hmm. <laughs> and like 
scares the heck out of everybody the first time <laughs> they do it. Uh, this one kind of makes them disappear from your awareness. Um, so I find that one to be a little safer in a first lesson. And I've got a, like a whole spiel I go through if they can't figure out how to do it on the first try of imagining you're cooling off hot soup. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's one of them. Um, depending on the student, um, then depending what they're looking to work on, we might do some breathing work based on uh, Thomas Hickson's Respiration for Singers. I like created some uh, breathing isolations to demonstrate the biomechanics in just a very like self-touch kind of way that is like, holy cow, I had no idea my body just did automatically. Um, so that's one that I've found to be really helpful and also one that translates really well to an online environment. Mm -hmm. um, and my current favorite are tongue bubbles. <laughs> so I don't know if you all know these, but uh, uh, it's like a lip trill, but with your tongue hanging out. So, <laughs> so that one's been a lot of fun. Yeah, the card is kind of the one that is my go-to. And whenever I teach a bunch of sample lessons at a high school choir clinic, I <laughs> get a whole bunch of people come in and be like, you're the buzzy card guy. <laughs> 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 what is that? <laughs> my students are running around with these cards that they buzz on them. <laughs> I love that. It's cool. I like that it's less threatening than the straw exercise. You know, it's not like spotlight on the problem kind of thing. It's more, you know, it's a, that sensation of minimizing, like you said, the, the registration changes. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I, like yeah. that. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. cool. um, do you see any trends amongst early students or younger students who are looking at high school or early college? Uh, things that you see either emotionally or technically or musically? Uh, that are happening on a regular basis? Oh gosh, trends. Um, and this is so different from the three regions I've taught it. <laughs> so true. Really? Oh well, my that's, gosh. That's really interesting because like we ask this question a lot and I didn't mean to derail you, but it's, it's important. It's important. Like we want to, you know, as we're approaching this, we ask students like, what are, what are common things we see with students? And there are regional differences. I think that's, yeah. that's, uh, uh, in, an insight in and of itself. <laughs> right? Yeah. In Chicago, all of my students were coming from a theater background mm -hmm. and choir, but music theater first <laughs> before classical. Wow. Um, there, there weren't that many students who were doing exclusively classical um, that, that at least I came into contact with. Um, they, they were all doing classical kind of like on the side, but really just trying to belt their faces off all the time. Um, <clears throat> and in Colorado, most of my, even though I was just there the one year, uh, most of my students had either been in choir or music and worship um, and very little classical experience. Um, and now here at Stetson, and I think it's partly because of, you know, our long reputation as a classical program. I'm just so surprised that hardly any of my students have uh, sung a lot of musical theater. When I bring it up, I'm like, so you're in music ed, we should learn how to belt before you leave here. I'm like, <laughs> belt? <laughs> and some of them are like, yes. <laughs> but I was just surprised by the number of my students who had, had really uh, trained exclusively in classical singing, um, classical solo and choral singing. Um, as far as trends is with the uh, technique or musicianship, um, you know, there's, they're all growing like, uh, undergraduate age 18, you know, for the tenors, baritones and basses, the, the vocal tract isn't done growing yet. Um, it won't be done until they're 20. Um, you know, the sopranos and mezzos are a little bit ahead on that count, but, <clears throat> Even the ones who have been, even the ones who have been training classically, there's still so much that can be done by improving the function of their articulation in the way that it works with resonance and then how that affects phonation and breath. Um, 
even the ones who can make a really cool sound coming in, it's like, oh my gosh, there is so much more fun stuff we could do. You're not even like really utilizing non nonlinear source filter interactions. <laughs> <laughs> I keep that comment to myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and uh, and then even with the ones who come in with a pretty like recognizable classical timbre, um, they're often, there's often so much more that they can do with, and I'm thinking primarily for treble singers because that's the majority of my studio right now. Um, there's so much more they can do with resonance work and really breaking free from, uh, from speech resonance into treble resonance and getting a better understanding of how to bring out the fundamental frequency in their tone when appropriate. And, and then really helping each one of those students make loudness, which is mostly about air pressure and intensity, which is mostly about resonance work to really make those independent and, and be two different things that they can control independently. It's, they just they come in and there's just so no matter what level they're coming in at there's just so much raw potential there and it you know within a couple of years you know it's like <laughs> think back to what this song felt like your first semester <laughs> um so those are kind of the trends i'm seeing it was there was one other trend um and this was especially at university of northern colorado and, and it's true here too um there are more students more high school age students going to uh, college wanting to be voice teachers. That stood out to me. Um, when I did my first interviews with my new students in Colorado, just every other one of them was like, I want to be a voice teacher. Like, that's what I want to do. I loved working with my voice teacher. I want to do that. I want to learn everything I can about how to teach people. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. It's really neat to see. That's, that's a cool thing. <laughs> That's a neat data point. Um, I think it's also interesting to that that um, they want to be a a voice teacher, not just a choral director, or not just a music teacher. Um, it's a specialized thing, and I think we're seeing a a lot of people who want to do that. And and to do that in this uh, time in this market means. Uh, such a different thing than it used to in terms of being aware of styles and aware of the science and the pedagogy. Um, it's a dynamic time to be a voice teacher. And really uh, I think that seeing students who want to do it is great, but I, I, I know with mine, a lot of them don't have the awareness of exactly what that means. And then that's just the start of this journey that they're, and they don't even know what they're in for. <laughs> Don't to be fair, no. <laughs> wasn't that true for all of us as well? I mean, oh, who, who absolutely. knew what we when we started? <laughs> absolutely. Uh. But it, it does bring us to an interesting point now, uh, since we're talking about what it means to be a voice teacher these days. And, and since we brought up uh, nonlinear <laughs> source filter theory, uh, to, what, what are you working on these days? I know you're doing a lot of work with New England Conservatory uh, and Ian Howell up there. But what, what is the point of, of research? What, what really gets you excited these days? What are you working on? Sure. So there's two, these are pretty, these are, well, one of them's really rooted in my work in the studio. And then one's a little bit more conceptual idea. I've been, I've been chipping away at for the last few years. Um, in my studio work right now, um, I've really been looking at uh, vocal learning so how, how the whole process works of hearing a new sound and then trying to recreate that sound and looking at like how that system works so I can create better cues, auditory cues and instructions for my students. So I can kind of life hack that system and try to like figure out like, okay, what are the cues that we normally give in a lesson that are actually conflicting information it's so like the obvious one is we teach from the piano and it's a percussion instrument and it doesn't have vibrato and the timbre, it doesn't have vowels really. Like when you're working on 
a classical, uh, well, an oval with a classical soprano and you're giving them C5 and it kind of, on my piano in my studio, it sounds like A, A, A. <laughs> and, like, and I would like using O. <laughs> and uh, um, so, and then thinking about like how I demonstrate and then all these like uh, kind of novel sounds. So I creating different kinds of auditory targets with like Made voice synthesizer so that to draw the ear to the part of the sound that we really want to tune the vowel to or bring out in the sound. Um, and also the, the vowel generator uh, or the vowel chart on Voce Vista video. And I've been doing a bunch of teaching using um, white noise. Hmm. So where you take, I've got like these little Bluetooth speakers and I play white noise out of them and you hold them up to your mouth and your vocal track filters out or filters and you can, and reveals formants in the white noise. So you can practice your resonance work. Uh, like if you're working on a pretty challenging um, lick in the, above the treble staff, you can practice resonating those frequencies and by guiding the ear to those, to those frequencies um, before you go to sing it, or just also just working on vowel articulation with this in uh in the kind of lower range for treble singers and throughout the range for non-treble singers so i've been really interested on like finding everything i can about how the mind uh processes new sounds and and then transfers that to an output from the voice and how that feedback loop of checking to see if it's right works um, and that's had a really positive impact of knowing when to jump in and reassure a student or um, how to give them a, a cue that'll work. The other side that, um, that I've been doing that's a little bit more on the conceptual side um, that I've uh, had some great correspondence with Ian and some of his grad students um, and uh, some of the other um, uh, faculty members there it, in the voice pedagogy program at New England Conservatory. Um, is looking at vibrotactile awareness and somatosensory awareness. Um, basically, uh, the idea is um, sound is a mechanical energy. It's mechanical vibrations through the air usually. Um, and when it comes to our ears, we perceive that as sound. When it comes to our skin, we perceive it as vibration. And looking at... Um, what are the uh, mechanoreceptors and nerve endings in our body that pick up vibrations, <clears throat> what, their, uh, what their range is, like which vibrations do they respond to, how does that correspond to challenges in singing, um, how much crosstalk there is between the somatosensory area of the brain and the audi uh, auditory cortex, and just how interconnected touch and sound are. Um, some of the research I've read point to uh, sound and touch having a common genetic origin um, and that the nerve endings in the mechanoreceptors that feel high frequency vibrations are very similar in structure and function to the nerve endings in the cochlea. And so, and then looking at which parts of the body feel vibration really intensely, which don't, what does that say about what we experience as singing? And then the big breakthrough I've had on my thinking for this is that um, vibrate, like uh, mechanical vibrations, um, we're really sensitive to those vibrations as touch in the range where we're not very sensitive to them as auditory. It's like below 300 Hertz we're really sensitive to that as touch. And then as it climbs above that, we start to lose the sense of touch of that energy, but then it starts to transfer over into the auditory domain and become more of an auditory experience. And so starting to really recognize like, okay, which parts of the human voice as we sing, which parts will we feel, which parts will we experience as an auditory experience? Um, and because of that, mm, there's, there seems to be 
a rel another relationship between touch and hearing where how we use both senses to locate something and starting to like give better direction on how to think about the sensations that happen in the skull during singing as localized sound instead of trying to push against them physically how to kind of listen for different parts of the sound listen to different parts of the listen in different parts of the body essentially like like looking for sounds to arrive in different places and what those are being caused by because i just had a lesson today with a student who uh uh, uh who hadn't mm, it was a new student um and experienced the a sensation of having high frequency energy as, as localized sound like near the region like behind her eyes or near the region of the soft palate and she was i was hearing like wow that's this is this lesson's going great <laughs> that voice just keeps getting stronger and clearer and all of a sudden she stopped and was like there's something loose <laughs> i'm hearing a second sound and <laughs> and uh it, it was really great to be able at that moment to jump in and and be able to reassure them knowing that that was probably it and remembering the first time i noticed that in my own voice and thinking my voice was broken <laughs> um so that that area is an area that it's it's just going to take me a long time to dig through all the research and plus even the most recent articles the introduction always starts with for articles on investigating uh sensory innervation of the vocal instrument or of the mouth or the orofacial region, they all start with, there's really not been a lot of research on this, or there's still so much that we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but just from what is available, it's it, each year it get, gets a little bit clearer picture of how we feel the feels <laughs> and what, what the bandwidths are uh, for different parts of the sound and I, I think there's some real possibility of getting much more evidence-based understanding of the sensation of singing. Well, and as a part of that, uh, you, you made a, a wonderful observation when I was uh, at New England, what was it, three years ago now, I think it was, uh, and so. talking about why sopranos so often talk about the sounds going straight up. Could, could you talk, do, just give it sure. in brief something yeah. about that? So I mentioned that it's the same energy, but different um different ranges of that energy we experience differently so we're really sensitive to vibration under 300 hertz um the high frequency vibration that we kind of think about uh a lot in singing it's particularly we're really sensitive to it between 250 to 300 hertz there are some other receptors lower down that pick up like stuff below 100 hertz um and then that that sensitivity to vibration as touch starts to weaken as you get above 300 hertz which is a your your round middle c e4 the passaggio right um <laughs> so as you go into the treble staff as far as like vibration frequency that starts to get weaker and weaker and weaker it takes more and more force to feel the same level of vibration and by the time you get to 800 hertz around g5 it's it's almost gone you can just like most people can't really feel those vibrations but they're still there ish and the highest they've been recorded uh is up to a thousand hertz um i believe the test that kind of confirmed this uh was <laughs> involved uh, uh working with these receptors in cats and being able to measure and see when the nerve stop or the the receptor stopped reacting. And so once it hit a thousand hertz, the receptor just stopped. So a thousand hertz is right under C6. And so that means as, as a singer goes, ascends above the treble staff, they're leaving the vibral tactile range. And by the time they get to C6, we can note the receptors that feel high frequency vibration, you're now outside of their range. So 
Yeah, when I I I've got a couple different ways of demonstrating this to just like take it outside of singing and it's it's been really helpful cuz I don't sing soprano obviously. Um but it's been really helpful for me to <laughs> as a teacher working with, you know, a lot of excellent sopranos to help them navigate that migration of how they're feeling the voice because the body's instinct and the mind's instinct with speech motor control is try to keep it the same try to keep all the feedback the same as they ascend and especially if their teacher is telling them to keep it the same um and they know they're supposed to keep it the same it's supposed to sound the same all the time um so as they ascend and that that vibration our sensitivity gets weaker and weaker even though it's still there it's just increasing in frequency then the body will start tr- pressing harder to try to bring that uh that frequency out more so that the 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 sensation stays the same and by the time you get to C6 that's usually a big old train wreck if you've tried to <laughs> hang on to the sensation you had down in the staff um so just helping them like really uh, accept that migration of how they're feeling the sound has been really helpful. Um, <laughs> it's great. I, I love helping people sing like five octaves higher than I can sing. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for me, this is, it's all very fascinating. And I think it's really interesting how um, kind of the evolution of how we teach voices moved from a very much a tactile and a sensation based and how does it feel and how do we experience it to, well, this is the science that connects back to why we feel what we feel when we feel it. Um, it kind of dipping back a little bit when you were talking about like, oh yeah, something's loose in there and, and remembering how that felt for you. Um, like oh my my voice is broken uh we a lot of times ask singers like was there a a moment for you where some of these things aligned uh and or a, or a point where you said oh that's that's how my voice works this is how i do this this is how i belt this is how i <laughs> navigate that passaggio um and i'm super curious as a person who knows the pedagogy knows the science looking back to a time when you were maybe only experiencing it as a sensation? Is there a time you remember saying, oh, this is how my voice works? I feel like I have one of those every month. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep, and you know, my students, you know, when I'll demonstrate something like, gosh, you make that look easy. <laughs> I'm like, I've just got a head start on you. <laughs> Don't worry, you're doing it way better than I did when I was your age. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, there are a few of them. And I, and I do feel like, each year I look back at the year before and be like, wow, I I had no idea where I was going to be the next year. And then I, I listen to myself I'm like, well, I still sound like me. I just have more fun doing it. Um, <laughs> but some big ones. Um, let's see. A, a, a more general one. I, I really am really grateful to my friend in Chicago who uh, I sang with in a, in a bunch of gigs and I, I, I would pick his brain and we'd talk shop and I loved the way he sang, sang and, you know, he studied with a teacher who I was like meeting a bunch of students from that studio in professional gigs. And I'm like, they all sound great. I don't sing like that. <laughs> <laughs> they all sing the same, but they all sound different. Um, and, uh, and he didn't, my friend wasn't a teacher, but he had he taught a couple people, but it wasn't really his thing. But, you know, I just asked him, like, I don't get this. Like, it sounds amazing what you're telling me, but I don't get it. And so he, he was my teacher for a couple of years. We would, we would go for a, you know, six to 10 mile run, <laughs> get brunch, and then work on singing for a couple hours. Um, again, this was in that last recession. So we all had a lot of time. <laughs> 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 but um, but that really got me turned around towards singing with efficiency instead of just force. And it kind of got me like, oh, wow, there's something else I can do with my voice. And then I had a couple of huge breakthroughs. I had the opportunity to work with, in a workshop with Don Miller, who wrote Residence in Singing um, and was, you know, really at the forefront of a lot of this work with Residence and making it more accessible to the voice studio through his work with Voce Vista. Um, 
which has now kind of evolved into Voce Vista video uh, through uh, work with uh, Bodo Moss and Wolfgang Zaus. But uh, Don Miller came to, um, to Chicago and did a workshop at Northeastern. And I got to work with him. I'd read his book. I Everything had just started to click about all the acoustic stuff. It only took me like four years of reading <laughs> everything so 500 true. times and like making weird sounds in my computer. And then it finally clicked. Um, and, uh, and I was so excited to show him what I could do. I hadn't gotten to work with an EGG, which <clears throat> measures closed quotient. And I'd read Don's work and be like, oh, okay. If you're above 70 to 75%, that means you're awesome. And if you're not, it means you're not, <laughs> but I'm sure I've got it. And uh, after the workshop or masterclass, I got to have like a one-on-one -on -one coaching with him and you know, got all hooked up to the EGG and, uh, and I sang and it was 60%. I'm uh, like, oh no, that's not good. <laughs> that's the bad one. And he's like, okay, we'll try this. We'll try this. And he had me like singing harder and harder and harder and like grunting and pushing. And it just stayed right at 60%. And, uh, and he said, huh, well, you seem like a nice enough fellow. And I was like, that's not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, well, wait, wait, well, let's try this. And then he had me like start my falsetto on a new and just glide down and then change to an awe and let it crack my voice. And I was like, well, I'll try anything. And uh, we did that a few times and all of a sudden something clicked and felt different. And it wasn't a sound I'd ever associated with singing. Um, and all of a sudden that needle went flying up to 75% and stayed there. I was like, he was like, oh, there you go. That's how you do it. I was like, <laughs> what did I just do? <laughs> so I ran out to the car and just did that in the car for like a half hour <laughs> to make sure I didn't forget how to do the thing I just did. Um, and then, and so I was like, okay, well that's singing with a high closed quotient. That's supposed to be really important. That feels really cool. That does not feel like what I had been doing, uh, before, it, it, but it kind of feels like what my friend's trying to help me do, but it's just kind of hyperspaced me to another place. And then, so I kept working with that idea and then I, uh, got to know Ken Bozeman's work and that kind of really unlocked this puzzle. It was all kind of in the same year where now I could like, oh my gosh, now I know where these acoustic registrations events are gonna occur. Oh my gosh, close timbre. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what an instructor a long time ago told me not to do when I let that happen and I lost an <laughs> octave off my range immediately. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, that's that, that going into close timbre on an uval in the middle of my range, that's what I remember from seventh grade choir. Yeah. Uh, that's my memory of my voice change is the first time when I went, oh, ooh, and I freaked out and vowed never to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so working with all that, then I started like taking, you know, his ideas about acoustic pedagogy, Ken's ideas about acoustic pedagogy for classical singing and working on those in my own voice and for my students. And I took his ideas for belting and then also just kind of basically like you know, flipping a lot of the ideas uh, for working with my belters. And a, a friend of mine um, who we taught together and she was singing a lot of theater shows She and was classically trained. She said, you know, I don't think I know how to belt. Do you know how to teach belt? I said, I think I just figured something out. And so we went and worked and I was like working with acoustics and doing all these different combinations, going back and forth across the break at E4. And it was going great. I was like, we've, we've got to create a divergent resonator. That's how we built. And, <laughs> and I'll show you how. And and we were playing around and it was sounding really cool and she felt good. And then all of a sudden something clicked where her sound got like five times as loud. And I was like, I didn't do that on purpose. What just happened? <laughs> and I was like, how did that feel? She's like, well, that felt great. How did it sound? I was like, that was really loud. She was like, really? Um, and then I went after that lesson, we did it and it kept going. I went after that lesson and, and went to a practice room and tried to recreate those steps in my voice. And when I got it, I realized it was the same thing that I'd learned from Don Miller. And I was like, oh, that's the thing. <laughs> like really efficient, powerful singing doesn't hurt. It feels kind of like nothing. And it's this weird cheat code 
Yeah, he just like <laughs> you just kind of go like A B A B up down left right, and then all of a sudden you're, there, your belt. I was in my head the contra code, right? I was like, I know I messed it up. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> so those are like a couple big things, and then you know the other, just working with Ken. Um, I had a an amazing weekend where I went up and took a bunch of lessons with him after I'd gotten to know his work and we worked together a little bit and um I I learned how to really sing an eval uh <laughs> during that weekend it was I, I always think back to that weekend and uh and then all the stuff I've learned from him since then also like a, the other really huge breakthrough was meeting Ian and and um hearing him talk about absolute spectral tone color and then talking to him at that conference in uh that Pava Symposium in Arizona. He was like, you should really check out Overtone Ionalyzer. I think you'd like it. And I was like, oh, Overtone Ionalyzer. I've never heard of that. <laughs> and then getting in there and being able to hear all the sounds that I'd been looking at as squiggles on the page to be like, oh my gosh, I have all the power to hear all the sounds. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, you know, all those things together are, have really influenced, um, like my understanding of my voice and how I approach teaching other people. Awesome. Very cool. That's great. <clears throat> <laughs> so we, we are at about that time. We, we're, we've gone for, for quite a while now. I don't know how that happens. So I don't know either. It's, I was, I was <laughs> looking at a clock just now, John, and I had the same reaction. I was like, where, where did that time how did that happen? <laughs> 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 We, we love to end with uh, a, a word of advice for our, our up and coming singers. So we, we're looking at our target audience of high schoolers uh, through undergraduates or those who have just graduated and are, are looking to enter the field. What do you say to your younger self, however many years ago, or what do you say to those who are, are just starting, starting off now? <laughs> Embrace close timbre. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always have to be loud. It just has to be intense. Um, <laughs> No, um, just to, it's kind of more of a general thing. Um, you know, look into everything you're interested in. That doesn't, that's not to steer you away from this. That's actually, you just never know what, what's going to happen. Like every day be working at, towards your goals even if it's a small thing when i when i got out of grad school and there was no work and everything was closed down um i i heard a comic say like the key to staying on track when you're just getting started is to make sure you did something each day towards your goal in your career and it doesn't matter what it is it doesn't have to be it's not headlining you know madison square garden every day it's you know the comic put it did, did you write today did you network today? Did you send one email today? Did you get new headshots? So I kind of like made a checklist of what are all the things I can do uh, that I could do like at least one of those every day and then see what happens. Um, so it was like, did I practice today? Did I have a voice lesson today? Did I check Yap Tracker today? Did I, did I look, did I, did I look at a new aria? Did I, at work? Did I go do a gig for free just so I could meet somebody? Um, and did I read something? Did I read an article? Um, did I figure out how to use WorldCat requests or interlibrary loan requests at the public library now that I don't, you know, now that I'm out of grad school and I don't have a library to use? <laughs> um, you know, and there were so many of these little like mundane things that looking back on it, it's just like, wow, that was, I'm glad I rolled out of bed that day. Um, <laughs> and it just builds after a while. Um, you know, just be open to unexpected turns. And because like the model for how this career is supposed to work, there isn't really one right now. It's, you know, it's really about entrepreneurship and your own artistic voice and your own stubbornness as far as just being like, well, I did 10 auditions and got rejected from nine of them, but I got one. 
<laughs> that's amazing. Ten <laughs> percent. That is amazing. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's high. <laughs> I was being optimistic. Um, <laughs> I, that was my rose-colored glasses moment. Um, <laughs> and uh, just you know, be a good colleague and be a friend. Um, have boundaries, but be a friend. It's just it's that's one of the coolest things. You know, I I grew up in the middle of nowhere. I you know, I wasn't really a social person as a kid, but just the people that you can meet in this field who are just like in the, in it because of the passion for it and the love for it. Um, there's just so many different ways for this to work and to never like to, tr to try, this is easier said than done, but to try when, when rejection comes, cause it will. Um, but to not take it as a judgment on you, just like, well, I wasn't the right fit, or I wasn't quite ready for that one, or I didn't know enough people there yet, or they actually had already filled up the spots. <laughs> um, and I'm just gonna keep, I'm gonna keep doing my thing and keep looking for my voice, but it's possible. And now with, with the current situation we're in, like it's, a, it's actually a really cool time because now, like everything's getting shaken up. There is no normal now. So you can make your own, you know, there, there are all these markets that are open all of a sudden because there's no live performing and everything went online. So you can reach out to people who are way farther away than you would normally collaborate with, you know, what we're we're spread out over <laughs> we're triangulating the country right oh, now really. uh, <laughs> so like there's more people are open to doing distance collaboration and distance voice work and it's in some ways it's a really terrifying time but it's a chance to to really really find your own way so you know, hang in there <clears throat> that's Great. awesome Chad, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been a really thrilling conversation to have. Yeah, and if, if I may, I'd just like encourage everybody to check out the, the Acoustic Vocal Pedagogy Workshop at New England Conservatory. Yeah. Uh, um, that we are having that each year um, in the summer and it's a really exciting place to, to meet and <clears throat> to totally <laughs> get way too excited about uh, sounds. <laughs> so yeah uh the acoustic vocal pedagogy workshop at new england conservatory and this year it's online so it's much more accessible this year since you don't have to travel and it is an amazing experience i'll, I'll speak from uh personal experience i was there their first year and it's it's been buffed up even even more since then uh it really is fantastic so i'd encourage anybody to go and check it out 